So welcome. Um, my name is Stephanie Ciccarello and I am the sustainability coordinator for the town of Amherst and my pronouns are she and her. So when you first speak uh, during this meeting, if you could introduce yourself and also include your pronouns and then you can proceed to um, with your comments as you wish. So we want to welcome you um, to this of the this is the actually fourth group that's meeting for the first time from the Energy and Climate Action Committee's task groups. And we're really excited to have you. The first three sessions have been wonderful and we expect nothing less of this session as well. So a little bit of housekeeping. If you could all mute your microphones if you're not speaking because um, picks up a lot of background noise and uh, may not sound loud to you, but it may be really loud to everybody else on the call. Um, so that would be great. And then if you um, are choosing to use video and you have some connection problems, you may want to turn the video off. Um, we'd love to have to see you during this meeting, but if you choose not to, that's totally up to you if you would like to have your video off. To continue, I actually, I might have to do something else pretty soon. So. Um, if you if you want no i'd love to continue but i i nominally i'm gonna i'm gonna um okay i'm not sure somebody has a microphone on and i can't even see where that is coming from so i think okay. it's rob oh he's okay he's rob you're muted now. now okay thanks rob and welcome um so we just wanted to point out that if for any reason this meeting is Zoom bombed, that's where somebody comes on and will say really offensive things or display really graphic and offensive material, please feel free to exit the meeting immediately and we will follow up and notify you of how we will, how and when we will reconvene. So we just wanted to let you know. Um, so as I said, please mute your microphones uh, unless you're speaking and um, I talked about the video. Uh, during this process, we would appreciate people taking the time when you speak, just take your time and um, there's no need to rush. We wanna give everyone an opportunity to really take in what's being said. So thank you. And I wanted to say that this process that we're doing is very different from the climate action plan development that we did back in 2005. There were very few people involved in that process in putting that um, plan together. And this time, uh, this is a much more inclusive process and we're really trying to get um, a diversity of opinions and perspectives and voices in doing so, um, which will also reflect in different priorities as well. So we wanna thank you so much for, for being here to be part of that process. And I'd like to begin by reading a land acknowledgement. So if you'll just bear with me one moment here. So this is a statement of the indigenous heritage of the land. We humbly acknowledge that we stand on Nanatuck land, acknowledging also our neighboring indigenous nations, the Nipmunk and the Wampanoag to the east, the Mohegan and Pequot to the south, the Mohegan to the west, and the Abenaki to the north. And with that, I would like to turn this over to Gazi Haya. Thanks, Stephanie. So I'm Gazi Haya, my pronouns are they, them. And um, in group activities like these, it can be really helpful to make agreements about ways we would like to be respectful of one another. So I'm gonna be introducing some possible agreements that we can start with today. And then as we get to know each other better over the next couple of meetings, we may find ones that uh, we want to add or change. So the first one is to put people and relationships first. Um, we want to remember that the climate issues that we're talking about affect real people and um, real aspects of their lives. And we wanna think about building an understanding with each other rather than winning or getting our individual goals or opinions um, met. And as a part of taking care of each other and ourselves, we want to encourage you to take a break when you need to, to um, turn your video off or mute yourself if you need to, to check in with your children or anyone else who may need your attention, 
to step away to use the restroom or to get a drink or a snack, whatever um, is best for you. We just trust you to take care of yourself and do that at any point. Uh, the second one is that we want to encourage you to really think about your language. Uh, we're going to um, attempt to just speak very slowly and clearly um, and avoid any jargon or technical terms because we all come to this meeting with different levels of experience around these issues. In the other groups, we've had translation and that has allowed us to have a natural pause in between people sharing. And it's been really helpful to make sure that we're all being very reflective and thoughtful about the things that we're saying. So to encourage that, we're going to ask you to raise your hand before you speak. Um, that can be just by holding your hand up if you're using video. Um, if you're not, you can use the Zoom function to raise your hand. Um, that's the, you can find it at the three dots next to your picture. And if you're on the phone, you can use it by selecting uh, star nine. And this will allow us just to keep um, a slow and thoughtful pace. The third one is that we want to encourage you to step up or step back depending on um, your personality and how you usually participate in meetings. If you tend to be a quiet person, uh, we want to try and make space for you to share more. And if you tend to talk a lot, we're gonna ask you to um, think about stepping back and sharing a little bit less. Uh, we want to also allow for some natural pauses and even uncomfortable silences because it's in those um, silences that some members may feel more comfortable or able to share. Uh, the next one is that we really wanna keep everything private and avoid crying. Um, keep what you learn about others, their families, their feelings, and their finances confidential. Um, when someone shares, don't ask for more personal information or details um, or for proof. If they're sharing something that they need or something that's not working, we don't want to ask people to prove it or to explain it more. We just want to take what they have to share. Um, and then the last one is that Generally speaking, um, values or ideas about right and wrong are really based on our culture or on our personal experiences. So we want to um, really work to acknowledge that everyone may be coming from different um, cultural perspectives in this meeting and we want to learn from each other. Uh, one way that we're doing that is that when you introduce yourself, please say your pronouns. We're going to ask you to really stick to talking about your own experiences and not talk about other groups of people or other groups experiences. Um, we want to, you to really consider committing to the idea that your version of right and wrong um, is likely just a cultural value and it may differ from someone else. So please consider being open to learning by asking lots of questions. And that's it for me. Great, thanks a lot, uh, Gazi Kaya. Um, I'm Jim Newman. My pronouns are he, him, and his. Um, I am. Uh, I work with Lanan Solutions. We're the consultant who is helping to facilitate this process. Uh, Lauren Delapara also works for Lanan, and um, we've been working with Gazi Kaya to uh, put this process together and help to facilitate it and our role is to really step out of the way but to keep things sort of moving along in a in a forward moving forward direction but in a stately pace i'm reiterate i'll reiterate one of the things that gazi kaya said which is about taking our time as we talk if you raise your hand one of us will sort of suggest that you're ready to talk because there are going to be times when multiple people want to talk uh, and what we'll probably do is wait a minute, maybe 15 seconds before we call on you, just so that everybody has time to kind of reflect a little bit on what we're hearing. What do we actually need to say? Uh, it doesn't mean you got to 
clamp down your ideas or not say things. The idea is to say things that really matter. Um, so now uh, we get uh, to, uh, I'll get to turn this over to uh, Darcy and Laura to talk a little bit about what, uh, what are we up to today? Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Darcy Dumont, and I'm one of the two town councilors on the Energy and Climate Action Committee, um, or ECAC as we call it. And um, the other um, member of ECAC that is here is our chair, Laura Drucker, who's going to speak after I do. Um, and um, as some of you know, Amherst changed its form of government uh, two years ago. We used to have a town meeting, and now we have a town council. Um, and the first act of the new town council was to form this Energy and Climate Action Committee, which was like a very upbeat um, action for its very first action. And um, so that was in January of 2019, and the, the committee um, had its first meeting by May of 2019. Laura was elected chair, and um, our, our first um, goal was to come up with town goals. And so by November of 2019, um, we came to the town council with proposed goals. And just before I get to that, the committee, when it was set up, um, was given a charge. So I was actually going to pull that up. Is there any reason why I should not do that? Good. Nope, go for it. Uh, let's sure see. Everyone will be able to read it uh, just because there's some people on phones and so their, their yeah. view is tiny, but that's all right. So um, if you want to read the whole charge of the Energy and Climate Action Committee, all you have to do is go to the town website. That's what this is. Can you see it? Can you see this on your screen? Yes. yes. OK, good. Um, so uh, it on the town website, it tells about um, the committee charge. It tells the names of all the people that are on the committee, including Laura and me who were at this meeting. Um, and it shows that there are seven resident members and two counselors. Um, and as far as the purpose of the committee, uh, you can see here that the Energy and Climate Action Committee was set up to guide the town in meeting its climate mitigation and resilience goals, which just to um, to address what Gazit Haya said earlier, um, a lot of people have some trouble with that language, climate mitigation and resilience. And basically all it means is climate mitigation uh, means doing everything we can do to prevent a worst case, case climate change scenario. And resilience means adapting or or preparing for the impacts of climate change. So the town is basically, the committee is basically tasked with both of those things, both trying to join and trying to, to prevent climate change and to prepare for it. So um, I'm not gonna read this whole charge, you'll be glad to know, uh, but, but number one basically asks the committee to come up with um, the long-term climate action goals. And then it goes on to say that we need to create a plan, which is what, we, this is part of that process to come up with a climate action plan for the town. And the areas in which the um, Energy and Climate Committee um, is looking as far as different sectors of energy use, 
are these that are listed in the charge, energy, built environment, transportation, land use, water, solid waste, infrastructure, open space, agriculture, and forestry. Um, and some of those we will be looking at as this task group will be, um, we'll be looking at transportation, solid waste, and um, infrastructure for public health and communication. Um, so uh, the other, just the other section that we might want to look at in the charge is just 6C, which is basically encouraging us as a committee to engage the public and relevant stakeholders in education, planning, goal setting, and development of climate actions with attention to inclusion of underrepresented groups and environmental justice communities, including but not limited to holding a hand, annual public forum based on climate action and the work of ECAC. So we are really charged with um, reaching out to the public getting a diversity of opinions on our planning and goal setting, et cetera. So um, we, I'm gonna take this off now. Um, we actually went to the town with our goals in November of 2019. And our, our goals were, our, our recommendations were very um, bold. We, we recommended a 25% reduction in carbon pollution emissions by 2025, a 50% reduction by 2030, and a 100% um, or carbon neutrality by 2050. So those were very uh, bold goals, and they were adopted by the town council unanimously. Um, so of course, we, we aren't, the town really isn't going to do that much before it now receives a plan from us. So Laura is going to talk a little bit more about the specific areas that this task group is going to look at. So I'm going to pass it on to her now. Great. Thanks, Darcy. And I'm on on an iPad because my computer overheats when I zoom and I keep like putting my hand in the camera. So I apologize <laughs> to try to touch the screen. Um, my name's Laura Drocker. I use she, her, hers pronouns. Thank you for joining today. Um, as Darcy said, I'm the chair of the ECAC committee. So our task group today is focused on four, our task group, not today, but throughout our work is focused on four key topic areas, transportation, waste, public health, and communications. And what we want out of this process is a climate action plan that helps us identify how we can transform our infrastructure around these four, four, four topics, how we get around, how we dispose of and treat our waste, how we communicate and receive communication um, from the town and with each other, and how we protect our community's public health. Um, and these transformations are to help us meet our goals to fight climate change, but that's not all. We also want to improve our infrastructure in these areas, um, which we know all of them could benefit from improvements to better support our community first and our ability to be resilient to the impacts of climate change. Um, we need to, we're at a t point in time with climate change where we need to be fighting as hard as we can to, re to reduce the impacts of a rise of rising temperatures, extreme heat, extreme weather, while also recognizing that these are, 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 are happening and will happen. And so how do we make sure our community can be resilient to these impacts? Um, just this week, you know, we had extreme weather events in which we needed to be communicating with our community and, um, you know, we know we have improvements to make from the MVP process, planning process to make sure everyone in our community is be being communicated with effectively. 
So what we really want to do in this task group is think boldly about how these issues can be addressed in Amherst, um, how we might push for state and national action when we need that to support our needs, um, and how these issues interconnect with so many other issues for which we're looking for solutions in our town. Um, I want to reiterate that no one needs to have expertise in all or any of these topics to participate in this discussion. I have expertise in zero of these topics, <laughs> um, but we all are impacted by them and that's why we're, we're, we're here. Um, I also want to say that we're not going to focus on all of these topics at once in this meeting um, or potentially in a meeting. Like we may not touch on all of these topics today, for example, but over the three um, meetings of the task group, um, our hope is that we can include all of ideas about all of these topics in our climate action plan. Um, to close, I just wanna say that we want our plan to be something that our community can get behind and that all members of our community see how they will benefit from its implementation. Um, so we're really happy to have this opportunity to begin that process with you all. Fantastic. Thanks, Laura and Darcy. Um, uh, so I think one of the key thoughts here is that we want to think about these topics, but we want to think about them in how they affect us and how, how they affect people. Uh, and that that is really kind of where, where this conversation uh, is starting from today. Um, so we're going to uh, start with a question for everyone. Uh, and it would be great if you could share your experience uh, in answering this question. Uh, so our question to start with today is really about transportation. Uh, the question is, um, when you uh, need to get somewhere important, somewhere that you need to go, uh, What's the easiest way to get there and what could make that better? So we all go to places we have to go. And uh, um, there's different, uh, you know, different ways to get there. Uh, what, what is, think about a particular place that you have to go. Maybe it's a school, maybe it's your work, maybe it's going to the store. Um, what's the easiest way to get there? And what would make that better? So we'll hold for a minute, let everybody think about that. And if you're interested in sharing your thoughts on this, give me a little wave or set the thing. Oh, I can... Great. I'm muted. I, so, um, I'm sorry, I was a little bit late. I'm Jennifer Moyston and I work for the town manager's office in the human resources department here in town. Um, so I did not have a car for like, I don't know, five, six years um, living in Amherst and um, getting anywhere but downtown was difficult. I, as you know, in the summer, the bus schedule changes, which is, I understand it, it makes sense, but it doesn't necessarily, it makes sense from the student perspective, but it doesn't necessarily make sense for the residential perspective. Um, you know, pushing strollers and, you know, kids, and I always had somebody else's kids with me too. So, it, it you know, go, going to the grocery store is a hardship because you can't take more than three bags on the bus. Um, it's just, and, and I've always thought like, what do you do? Because I completely understand PVTA for reducing it because they don't, the need just isn't there anymore. And also you can't really get, it's better now, trust me. It's much better now that we have the, I think it's the 36 or the 38 that runs past the Boulders East Hadley Road, um, the Atkins bus. Um, so I, I know that that is appreciated. My kids appreciate it, um, but it doesn't run very often all the in during the off season and I think it's actually replaced with the Hampshire College Mount Holyoke bus and there's concern like if 
the schools aren't, you know, fully open? Is that Mount Holyoke Hampshire College bus going to even run? So, I, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to carpool with people like, hey, are you going to the grocery store this week? Just let me know. And so that is a way that people can connect with and build community. But at the same time, like the, I don't know how to solve that bus issue because it's completely understandable. It's just depends on what perspective you're looking at it from that makes it a hardship that can possibly make it a hardship. Uh, that's, uh, that's a great, great set of thoughts, Jennifer. Thanks a ton. Um, and I, I would caution us today, not to just what you're saying, not to try and solve the problems. We're going to have plenty of time to solve the problems. So we're going to have a whole couple more meetings and we'll get into solving problems. Let's identify the problems and then identify what matters about the problems. That's kind of where we're headed right today. So thank you. That was a, a nice job. Uh, anything else you want to say in that? <laughs> uh, uh, I, if I have something else later, I'll, I'll uh, please. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Eve. So my name is Eve Vogel and um, I go by she, her. And um, <clears throat> right now I'm talking to you from Portland, Oregon, where I used to live. And um, one of the things I love about Portland is it has a fabulous bike infrastructure program, uh, which I witnessed, uh, you know, sort of the whole process of advocacy and construction and gradual development from the time I lived here in 1991 to the time I left in 2008 and moved to Amherst. <clears throat> when I got to Amherst in 2008, I was really surprised at, um, you know, the relative lack of bicycle infrastructure and support. There are some bike lanes, but not that many. Um, and there is not an interconnected network they're not particularly plowed or maintained in the fall or the winter. Um, I, when I had a preschooler, I used to do the bike and bus thing a lot. And so it was very hard to coordinate, especially, you know, when I was attempting to continue to bike into December and January, that was pretty impossible. Um, <clears throat> and I've spent about the last, 11 years on various different transportation committees trying to advocate for an improved bicycle network um, as well as actually an improved transit, transit and walking network. Um, and it's been very slow and at times frustrating. And I am convinced from my experience being in Oregon that if we had a really strong network, um, that and, and, it, and it were much easier and much safer and it felt safer even for people who weren't experienced bicyclists, people who were new college students from the suburbs or people over you know, 55 like I now am, um, you know, um, to feel safe that we could really, um, you know, a lot more people would bicycle and, and it would just um, be a viable transportation alternative that would feel comfortable and safe and accessible. And we could have much more of a transportation mode shift. And, you know, Stephanie, you know, anyway, I won't talk about other people's experience, but I've been part of a whole bunch of other efforts in town and, and we have done a fair number of things, but I just think that um, there remains a lot more to be done that would, that would help me and a lot of other people. Uh, great, thank you, Eve. Uh, that's a, um, a, a great, and again, that was nicely done tying it to your own experience. Uh, and I encourage us to tie these comments to our own experience. Kazikaya, do you want to uh, say something? Well, I was going to ask a favor of John, but he just sat down, so we're good. I get really nauseous when people are moving on Zoom. <laughs> So I was going to ask if you could turn your video off if you were going to still walk, but it looks like you're in one place. So I'm good. Thanks. Thanks. Oh.
Uh, Jennifer, mm -hmm. you want to say something? Well, else? I think that Brenda has her hand. Did you have your hands up? And I'm okay with letting her talk because I've heard. Okay, thank you. And Tessa has her hand up as well. Oh, yes. Hi, folks. Um, I'll share in a moment, but I just wanted to ask, are notes being taken? I know it's being recorded, but I just didn't know if we were capturing this. Yeah, great. Okay. So um, I am an avid biker, and I was out yesterday and had two different experiences throughout the day, one being on the bike path, which was glorious, and the other uh, needing to be on roads that did not have the bike path, and it was, uh, frankly, uh, dangerous and, and very scary. Um, so. I have uh, a lot of different thoughts around that. Being in a college community here, there's um, very few few bike lanes. So I, I'm gonna just piggyback everything that um, I think Eva was saying. Um, and uh, in addition, um, educating um, drivers about how to interact with bikers and um, having places to keep bicycles. Um, so if you're going to work, you know, having um, a, a shelter that's locked, uh, maybe even that provides repairs uh, throughout the day. There's some musical events where Mass Bike is present and offers these kind of services and it's wonderful. Um, I'd say uh, getting, um, I'd love to see, you know, kids doing the, the bike buses. Uh, to getting to school. So again, that would require having um, education to, to kids and, and adults on, 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 on bike riding. And um, I live in South Amherst where our roads have been um, treacherous to travel on um, with huge potholes. Um, so bikes are, are weaving like this around cars. So uh, improved surface of roads um, and I love the idea of maintaining the um, bike lanes often they're not plowed um, and bike path uh, that'd be fabulous and I'll also say bus is a second favorite way to 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 get around but it's it's so challenging around here um, and um, I'd love to see uh, again being in south amherst um, small buses that can get under the underpass often south amherst is not not service for uh, uh, the difficulty accessing it because we have overpasses so let's look at like small shuttles that can be uh, doing smaller smaller runs connecting so i love that question it's a great way to to introduce oneself and some ideas so thank you you're welcome. Tessa, do you, uh, do you have something you want to share? Yes. So my name's Tessa. Um, I go by she, her. I'm going into 10th grade at the high school, so I have some student perspective, I'd say. Um, so usually I take, I live about 10 minutes from the high school, and usually I'd have my parents drive me, which is not the most environmentally friendly way to get to school. Um, yeah, so I need to work on that. But I feel like a main factor of one of the reasons why I don't take the bus to school is because I always am unsure about the timing and feeling like I'll be late and miss it and just all this other reasons. So I did have an idea about that. I used to live in New Haven, Connecticut, and I'd take the university shuttle to school because it, there was a building right next to my old school that was like part of the university's buildings. And um, they'd have a tracker, they'd have an app tracker where you could check on your phone where the current bus is and like how far it is to your stop and where it is. So it would help like students plan when they're supposed to be at the bus stop, which might help kids catch the bus and feel more inclined to take the bus. And I also always support like energy buses because those are so much nicer and better for the environment. And I feel like that makes students feel like also more inclined to take the bus, which is a big thing. And then um, another story to share if I'm not talking too much. Um, I remember a little story where my sister wanted to go to her friend's house, but my mom, she, my friend lives like maybe a 10 minute walk too, but my mom didn't want her to go because the roads were a little like unsafe and there wasn't many sidewalks or anything and probably poor lighting because I think it was later in the evening. and. 
So we had to like drive home and then drive my sister to her friend's house when it would have been just so much easier for her to walk. So I think like implementing more, I don't know, street lights and crosswalks, just so it seems like there's more walking paths to people's houses, especially during Corona when you can't like, really, it's kind of unsafe to like be in cars with other people. It might help to get out and probably encourage more people to get out and be active if there's more like crosswalks and walking paths around that might help people. Yeah. That's, 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 that's a, a great thing to say. And it's uh, really, I think, valuable right now to bring up the pandemic and like the effect it's having on how we all do things. Yeah. And uh, yeah, being able to walk and get places uh, is huge. Mm -hmm. uh, it, all of a sudden it was important before now it's everything yeah go ahead Eve first I had a clarification question for Tessa when you mm -hmm. were talking about the buses were you talking about school buses yeah the school okay. buses and then just a brief comment that um, I, ha I completely agree about the access to just sidewalks and crosswalks and lighting. Mm -hmm. my, we live off East Pleasant and my son could not walk from our neighborhood, you know, yeah. to any neighborhood because East Pleasant is just way too dangerous for a child to walk on. Mm -hmm. That's close to where I live too. So. Thanks. Yeah, safety is big. That's where it's at. Um, someone who hasn't spoken have uh, have something to say? Yeah, Andrew. Don't forget to introduce yourself. Hi, Andy McCall. Uh, he, him, his. Uh, I work for the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Uh, so what I'm going to say at the moment absolutely applies in Amherst, but just an experience that we've had around the region. Um, uh, last year, for some public outreach, we actually went out and surveyed just, we kind of just, you know, walking down the street and you ran into somebody. We just wanted to ask them some questions about their preferred modes of transportation and compared to what they use for uh, transportation. And almost everybody drove a car, mostly single occupancy, but none of them, it was their preferred method. It's just unfortunate where we are. It, it was really amazing out of, I think we talked to probably um, I, I can't even say the number, but I'd say at least 80% of the people we talk to use a vehicle, a car, single occupancy vehicle on a daily basis, but it was absolutely not their preferred method of travel. It was just kind of a thought to throw out there for you. Uh, that's great. Uh, you want to say anything? Uh, Penny, you want to jump in? Yes. Hi, I'm Penny. I'm she, she, and she. <laughs> um, I've lived in Amherst for, uh, we moved here from California in the 70s. So when I moved here, I was, um, I think I was like uh, eight. And um, we always took the city bus in LA. And um, so I have a lot of experience taking the bus and when we I lived in a uh, colonial village and um, the bus came right to our doorstep back then and it would cart us right uptown and, um, and we were like yay free but um, as a child the P the PVP bus was like the best thing because uh, we moved to Puffton Village and uh, here again it was right at our doorstep and so um as a kid we i took the bus all the time not the school bus but pvpa and um so i didn't get a car until i was 22 and i then i had my kids and i wasn't i was grateful that i had a car because i wasn't loading on my gang up in onto the bus so that was really nice but we always my community that i had friends we always did carpooling and um and my daughter imani we carpooled from pvpa when she went to pvpa and then my kids went to um 
the Waldorf school and we always carpooled. So I've always been in the carpool gang. And um, so <laughs> I, I, I really like the bus, but right now I have a car and um, my friends, they call up for a ride and I'm always willing to give someone a ride to the, um, to the store or wherever you have to go. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So. That's awesome. Thanks, Penny. Thank that, you. That sort of thought, again, you know, it's like, well, our needs change over time, right? It's like, when I'm a kid, I need to do this, and I'd rather not have my parents drive me around or have to do this, And but now well, I've got kids, and I need to do this. And But if you're, in, I was in a single family home, so my mom was at work. So it was either you stay home or you take the PV bus. Right. And it was always a bummer in the summertime because we did a lot of walking because the buses are like, pfft. back in the 70s and 80s, the bus did not run in the summer at all. It was like ghost times, very, very seldom. And you couldn't visit a friend in Leverett <laughs> or Montague or any of the outer things because you would be walking so that was the only bummer about that part totally um i'm gonna yeah i'm gonna let lev uh talk for a sec jennifer so yeah go ahead lev and then we can go to tracy thanks everyone um and don't forget to introduce yourself Great. I'm Lev Benezra. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and uh, I'll acknowledge I'm questioning a bit in terms of speaking from my own experience versus sharing others. Um, I don't live in Amherst. I believe that the reason why I was um, invited to be a part of this group uh, is because of my role at the Amherst Survival Center. And so I think I have some insight within that context, but I'll try to bridge that and at least identify from where I'm speaking. Um, but I will say first from my own experience um, in Amherst, I originally grew up in a more urban area um, in New York City. My family moved to Amherst and um, definitely uh, I relied on my parents a lot to drive me around, certainly, um, you know, walked and biked and took the bus some as well. Um, but I, as I got older and was trying to move around more on my own, um, I started going to GCC when I didn't have a car. And I remember very distinctly that it took two hours and 45 minutes to get from Amherst to GCC on the bus either way. Um, and I was still living in Amherst and didn't have a car um, working in Holyoke. Um, and similarly, it took uh, well over, I think, I don't know, an hour and 40 minutes or something to get to downtown Holyoke from Amherst, what was about a less than a 20 minute drive. Um, and that actually was a key factor in, or it was among the key factors at that time of my decision to move to Northampton um, was to have a much easier commute to where I was working at that time. Um, and uh, at this point, um, definitely my main mode of transportation, I kind of walk when it's a short distance. I love walking places. Um, I used to bike a lot. I don't do that as much anymore for a variety of reasons, um, but I drive and that's how I get places. And um, I really, what Andy said in terms of that being the easiest or the most convenient and oftentimes feeling like the only feasible option, I'm lucky enough to have a car and can consistently put gas in it. And so that is at my fingertips, but it, it's not necessarily how I want to get around, but it's like the thing that feels like it is the way. Um, and I want to just acknowledge that I think living, um, this is something that I definitely also can feel from my own experience and then relate to people who I know here at the center is that 
I live in Greenfield and am able to have this job here and I could not do that if I did not have a car that, you know, previously, honestly, I don't, you know, just, and at any different juncture of many like different jobs and living arrangements around the valley, I would not have been able to have those jobs um, without access to a car, even if I could occasionally take the bus or occasionally more as a fitness thing, just rode my bike a long distance. It's like it was not tenable in terms of a daily commute. And that's a huge piece that I hear on a really regular basis when we're talking with folks who want to get back to work, are stuck in a job that really doesn't pay a living wage or sufficient, is that transportation is oftentimes, if not the top, it's like the second top barrier to having a wider option in terms of jobs to work. Um, and that in Amherst in particular is enormously impacted by the difference in the bus schedule between the school year and the summer, or even just week long breaks in the summer. Um, similarly, the, um, the bag limit on the buses is an incredibly challenging um, issue for folks seeking to utilize the bus for any kind of basic needs. Um, and the fact, this is not speaking from my own experience, but speaking from things that have been shared with me, um, that uh, the, the feeling is that that bag limit, because it's up to individual drivers to actually um, uphold it or not, um, I have a very clear perception that it is not upheld equitably and that um, that people experience different amounts of it being upheld or being told that they can't bring their groceries on the bus or they can't have their kids and their groceries on the bus or whatever those things are um, definitely along racial lines also along lines of someone who's struggling with a mental health challenge and presents in a way that's grumpier or you know ruder or whatever and that's a really key reason to have clear and consistent policies is then it's not up to the individual discretion of someone upholding that, whether they are drawn to or like that person, whether it's because they look like them or because they, I don't know, seem really nice or whatever that thing is. Um, so yes, and feel free to let me know if I shouldn't be speaking from other perspectives, but I feel like that's kind of why I've, um, it makes sense for me to be a part of this, that this group is from that role. Um, Lev, thank you for sharing both your your personal experience and the experience uh, that you've gathered at the Survival Center, which is obviously uh, highly relevant to the to the conversation. And appreciate it, um, Jennifer. You looked like you were about to say something. Do you want to jump into that? Don't forget, you got to unmute. Yeah, I know. It's much better for me to be on mute than not be on mute, though, because who knows what I might possibly say. Um, I just wanted to piggyback on a few people's comments. Like, um, Eve, I think I'd gone to a D5 meeting because you were speaking and I was like, oh, I'm having deja vu from this conversation. But I think you spoke about Portland at a D5 meeting once. And um, I'm not a bicyclist at all but I do appreciate it. And I can't remember exactly where I was, but there was a lot of parallel parking. So something like this might only work in the downtown area, but the cars that were parked was the barrier for the bicyclists. And so they just rode in between the sidewalk and that space, which is also really good for people who are walking. And for some reason, people don't walk on the sidewalks all the time here. It drives me crazy, but um, when there are sidewalks, so, um, so that might be a good, I'll, you know, I, I think the only space that's big enough really is in the downtown area, but it, you know, it's a start and it's a little bit of something. So that's good. And I just also wanted to piggyback on the buses again and say, there's an issue of um, if you take a B43 and then need to take the 31 home, the B43 gets there after the 31 leaves and so whatever cycle the bus is on is where you're at so you know again i i understand pvt and i'm just not quite sure how that gets fixed but those are like i just remember that that was a struggle like i've got kids with me or whatever with me and i'm getting off the b43 to go home and now i have to wait it's summertime another hour for the 31 to come back so yeah that's it 
Um, uh, Gazikaya, you can jump in with a quick comment and then Rob, you've had your hand up for a little while. Thank you for being patient. Oh, I was just gonna say, I'll go ahead and um, just share from personal experience some of the things that Lev was touching on so that we also have the personal experience perspective. And I appreciate your sensitivity around that, Lev, but I do think it's helpful for you to share when you think something's being missed because it's important for us to get those perspectives too. Um, but yeah, also like Jennifer said, you know, um, groceries is the biggest problem about the transportation um, in terms of buses, um, food and groceries, uh, because actually South Amherst is qualified as like a food desert um, because of the way that our buses take like four hours from where I live at the brook to get to the grocery stores. And because of all that stuff that Jennifer was talking about, how you just miss the next bus, that also applies to the 31 to the Amity Street bus, which is what goes to the grocery stores. And then the bag limit makes it so that you definitely can't pick up your monthly um, box from the survival center because it's a lot of food. And I'm grateful that it's a lot of food, but there's, the, it's like, virtually impossible to get all that food on the bus unless you just luck out like Lev said and get a bus driver who just decides to be nice to you that day but that's not a like a it, it's nerve-wracking to go to the survival center without knowing if you're going to get that bus driver and if you have three kids with you in a stroller they can be really weird about strollers too and that's something that was really stressful for me when Galileo was my eight-year-old now. But when Galileo was in a stroller, they were like often really harsh about strollers. Um, and then the other thing about like coronavirus now is like Penny said, I used to, I now have a car and I used to give people rides to the survival center regularly um or to the grocery store and now like i've been more cautious about who's in the car with me and i feel really awkward and like i tried to coordinate for the survival center box to be dropped off at a couple of neighbors and then it got taken like somehow in like 15 seconds that i wasn't there or i don't know what happened but it disappeared and that was really discouraging so there's been a family that i'm just like splitting my box every month with because we just that's the option that we've come up with to make it work but like if we just had a bus system that <laughs> would allow us to bring food home um it, in a reasonable amount of time then we wouldn't have to be doing all of that yeah it sounds sounds like a thing thanks uh to both of you for sort of talking through all of that actually all three of you um, Rob, you've had your hand uh, up for a while. You want to jump into this? Sure. Um, so, don't I, forget to introduce yourself. I, I'm I'm Rob. My my pronoun is Rob or I or he. You you could get to choose. Um, it's interesting to hear the comments. I've been waiting a long time to uh, say anything because uh, when I first came to Amherst, I was already a a veteran transit user and walker and bicyclist and I got drawn into public service in trying to improve the transit system at least I thought back then it was an improvement because of uh, noticing my own neighborhoods transit was about to disappear and uh, somehow I got drawn into the town's committee system back in the late 1980s and uh, I thought we worked pretty hard to make transit and actually cycling work well for a community that had very little of it in the decades before. But I hear Eve, my neighbor, and I agree with her that we can always do better. <laughs> um, right now, there's this terrible tension between using public transit and obviously public health, the coronavirus that has made public transit really challenging to use. Maybe not so much in Amherst because the buses are relatively empty, at least during the summer, but imagine we were in a major city like New York or Philadelphia or Boston and trying to use subway services. So I think this is gonna be one of the biggest challenges in the next few years to using public transit. Walking and cycling are still 
nice ways to get around. Um, I unfortunately find myself personally between two different locations where not even public transit is, is available and very distant locations. And so one of the things that I, I wanna bring to the conversation, which hasn't been mentioned, I could sort of reiterate many of the good things I've heard, but most of the people who drive in this town and most of the people who would use buses are students at UMass, where I also am a math professor and been monitoring this phenomenon for more than 30 years now. And I've scratched my head for at least 30 years, having traveled all over the world and gotten to the places I'm trying to get to, usually by train or train and a bus or train and a bus and a long walk. Why not only hasn't the United States, but the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and to some extent more pressure from us here in, in Amherst, including the university and the town. I, I used to be on the select board, so I worked on it as an elected official. I don't know why we couldn't do better. I was working on it even this February, just before coronavirus hit. I was at a meeting in Springfield trying to get East-West Rail reestablished. But most of the people who actually would ever use a bus regularly or who would ever, and, and unfortunately who often drive regularly, are the tens of thousands of UMass students. And the bus system we have now, for better or worse, and I heard a lot of the worst, it was designed to accommodate five college students, especially UMass students. So a lot of the things we find that don't work too well for us non-student people, and with all due respect to the student from ARHS who's here, good to, good to have met you virtually, um, we've got to figure out a way to get longer distance transportation besides Peter Pan. I mean, we need to get better train service between Boston, New York, and places like this, this major university. And until we do that, I'm afraid we're going to always be struggling with the tens of thousands of cars that appear in town. Well, maybe not this September, but maybe next September. Um, and then all the concomitant issues with, with all those cars. And, you know, let me just say, I don't know whether um, the fellow from PBTA knows, but I, I'm very good friends with Glenn Barrington, who's the director of UMass Transit. And uh, we, we talk on the phone a couple of times a semester, sometimes more frequently. Um, he's told me that, that over the last few years, the number of students using the buses has declined. More and more students tend to drive to campus. And um, that's a really unfortunate trend. Um, it's probably gonna get worse given the coronavirus situation. And the other thing that I learned from many of you, I had no idea, and I'm hoping the fellow from PBTA might give some guidance on this, is that I'm the guy who actually designed the bus service to the markets, the grocery stores 20 years ago, and 20, more than 20 years ago. And it's, it's evolved quite a bit, but I had never heard of a three bag limit. And I, that seems so easy to eliminate. I'm gonna get on the phone when this is over and talk to Glenn about it. But if uh, you know, we can do anything to avoid that, I, I can sort of imagine why there might be such a, such a rule, maybe to avoid tons of garbage bags or something or possession bags when I look, look at it. But this makes no sense. And so I'm hoping that could be taken care of quickly. So many of you commented on it. That seems very unfortunate. So anyway, I've been I've been riding riding buses and trains since I was small enough to not have to pay a fare in Philadelphia. And I was raised by my grandmother, who was you know, she'd be about 125 years old this past spring. And I remember her in her 60s and 70s when we'd go walking together. I was too young to carry a bag. She would have a grocery bag in each hand. And uh, I used to say she had a grip like a, like a brick mason. She could carry, carry a heavy bag in each hand. Sometimes I think it was two in each hand. If I could help as a five or six year old, I would carry one little bag. So, uh, you know, I'm very sympathetic to that in a very immediate way. So and I really enjoyed listening to everybody's comments. And I'm, I'm going to go back to mute now. <laughs> Just listen. Thanks. Thank you, Rob.
uh, that's that's great. So there's a bunch of people who have their hands up. Uh, well, Brenda, go ahead. I'd love to be able to carry a, a bicycle on that train when we get it, the east-west and, and uh, north-south, because that's that's not been permittable. And, uh, and, and to make it um, economically uh, accessible, because it's so cost prohibitive. Whenever I'm asking people like why they're not taking our, the train that we have. Um, and um, just thinking about the, the bike share, um, uh, safety of one, I'd love to see like helmets provided for our, our wonderful new bike share. Um, I see so many folks using that. And, um, and if there's any way to have like tandems, um, trying to not get into solutions here, but uh, thinking of folks like with disabilities, uh, I remember taking, you know, my kids to their friend's house on a tandem bicycle, you know, um, if, if they were like, you know, when they were too young to hop on the back of the bike or, or a bike of their own. Um, so that's a fun idea. And, um, and then a car share. Um, you know, I, I'm hearing a lot of that, maybe more formalized kind of car share uh, in in town. And I think we, I think there's one maybe in one of the new buildings, uh, but getting that more accessible to to folks. Thanks. Thanks, Brenda. Um, the uh, the overall, the I think that one of the things we're hearing is the sort of some of the one of the things that is important in thinking about transportation is think about transportation that fits a lot of different needs uh, as opposed to squeezing the needs down opening the needs up um, that seems to be something that's coming up tracy you've been very patient <laughs> hi um so i don't know before oh, wait am I, I think you need to introduce yourself Oh, I'm Tracy. Um, I use uh, she, her, her, and um, I live in Amherst. And um, I've I've been thinking about transportation, climate change, sustainable transportation for a long, long time. Um, both like in my jobs and uh, with nonprofits and on Amherst committees. Um, so when Rob was talking, and fortunately, I've met um, a number of you already. Um, through other work, some of it going back two decades now, um, the amount of time I've been to Amherst and then others of you I've met more recently and I'm glad to meet the rest of you today. Um, when Rob was talking, I mean, one of the things and, and in other people's remarks too, I keep thinking about some of the challenges with connectivity, like between, you know, when you wanna get from one place to another, if you're looking at alternative modes besides the car, like how can you do that? Um, you know, I always think about with East Hadley Road, for example, like what a challenge it is that if you want to take the bus from East Hadley Road out to the malls, right, you actually need to take the bus into the center of Amherst and then back out to the mall because there's no direct route, even though you're only like a few miles from the malls. Um, and of course, with COVID, of course, people are taking the bus less too. But, you know, a lot of the people who live out there, they actually end up walking, which of course limits like how much you can carry. Um, in terms of connectivity too, um, one thing I've been hearing people talk about, so I've been reading about just how much more demand there is for biking and bike sharing and so on, particularly with COVID is people don't want to get on buses. And that it's really, really a shame that the town of Hadley chose to not allow Valley bike share program to like set up any stations in the town of Hadley. Because, you know, I know people who live in Amherst who travel either to the malls on with their Valley bikes, so they have memberships or they want to go to Northampton or Northampton people who want to you know, go, anyway, it's just that if there were stops in Hadley, including near the malls, that would be huge and that would increase like so much accessibility. And, you know, it was a vote. Um, it was a vote in Hadley where they just said, no, we don't want to be a part of this program. But I really hope that the town of Hadley will revisit that. Um, so when I first moved to the area, um, I used to work, I live in Amherst, I used to work in Greenfield. I, you know, I typically would drive, but then for a while my car was broken. And my boss was like, well, you still need to show up at work. So I realized that if I took the bus, it would take me twice as long as if I biked. 
And, you know, at the time I was in my early 20s, so I just like hopped on my bike and I biked and so on. But that's not an option for everybody, but it's really a shame that even I, who is not a fast cyclist, like could get there much faster by bike. Whereas the bus trip would take, you know, well over an hour um, or an hour and a half. Uh, so in my daily life, um, unfortunately, I do use cars a lot. I have two kids who have a number of activities. Their activities are often back to back. And I'm getting like, you know, pulled with sports and other stuff like all over, all over the valley and beyond, unfortunately. So um, there's just no way to do those trips, and especially, you know, kids will have multiple activities at the same time and everything. To, there's no way to do those trips with different modes. So a lot of it is um, done in single occupancy vehicle. I mean, my preferred mode when I have time is I really like, I do bike some, but I just like the ease of walking. Um, and I walk a lot because I live near downtown. I walk a lot downtown. I do a lot of errands on foot intentionally. Um, and it's great, you know, for exercise and so on. My challenges with downtown um, for walking, and also it's so much easier than trying to park downtown and those issues. Um, but the challenges I have with walking sometimes is that like some of the sidewalk infrastructure is not that good. And there is really, there are sections that even where we have sidewalks, they're not that walkable. Um, and then also there's not a lot of lighting. So like in some parts of the downtown, it's very dark at night, which of course, particularly if you don't have good sidewalks, that makes it worse. Um, but yeah, that's my preferred mode. And I mean, I'm fortunate because I can both walk to downtown and I can walk to my job. I work at UMass. So thanks. Great. Thank you for uh, sharing that. Uh, um, also that uh, um, the, the sort of overall thought about safety, I think, is really, that's, that's huge. It starts to rise up. Um, oh, and sorry, sorry. Oh, and even I, we've been trying to do this work about, like, improving connectivity and stuff, but right. it stalled with COVID, <laughs> so. Because, um, um, do you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to respond real quickly to the idea about car sharing. I think that is an interesting idea, but one thing that's real for a lot of families is because of um, the way that driver's licenses, like access to driver's licenses are limited, um, there are a lot of people who wouldn't have access to that. There's a lot of really good work being done right now at the state level about getting um, access for driver's licenses for folks. But like if I think about my neighborhood, Right now, there's a lot of families who don't have cars, not just for financial reasons, but because they're unable to access documentation to be able to legally drive. And if they were pulled over, then they would risk like being deported. So um, until that gets fixed up, people have to rely on public transportation. Um, and so that's, that's just an important thing to consider when thinking about the ride sharing. Um, and then uh, in terms of those um, sharing bikes, just something that has been brought up in other groups is that for um, the places where the bikes are put at the buses, it's made them not accessible for people in wheelchairs. And so that seems to have been like a huge uh, lack of uh, awareness or a uh, example of ableism that um, that has like created a real problem for people um, in wheelchairs and who have other access needs in including people with strollers um, trying to access the bike so um, because of the position of the uh, bikes you can't get on the bus so that's just another thing to bring up I think that's a that, that thank you for reminding us of the of the conversation, there was a conversation in a previous group that was really talked a lot about that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, wheelchairs are very tricky. Walkers are very tricky. Things like that getting in the way of walkers is, is huge. Uh, um, Jennifer, Penny, Tessa, you have things you want to add to this? We'd love to hear from you. No, I think we're, I 
think I've said enough, and I love that everyone what they've already said. Sorry about the background noise, um, but yeah, <laughs> thank you. Awesome, thanks, Fanny. Yeah, I don't think I have anything else to say either. Thank you. Um, of course, I always have something to say. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add, though, I was at another meeting, and somebody had brought up and I know we're not talking about solutions but just community like if the community had been more involved with each other like as a community as a whole then some of these other problems wouldn't exist and so I mean as someone who didn't have a car I'm always like happily ready to give somebody else a ride it's a little different during COVID times but um, and I used to work at the Amherst Survival Center and I would bring home people's boxes all the time it was just because people needed the food and, and to access. Um, but I also think that as a, we need to start retraining our community for lots of things, like just, right? Because people are like, why would you have to police the, ma you know, pe police people for masks? Well, if we were all working as a community and like we want to protect each other, then we wouldn't have to. And so that's, it's, and that person made a great statement, which was we're so quick to call to the police for help which is true, but if we're working as a community, then we wouldn't have to as much. So um, I don't know how that fits into it, but that's like my new thing, like go community. Good new thing. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna switch the conversation up. I've been sort of moving us this direction a little bit. Uh, and it's a, Jennifer, that's a great uh, lead in. Um, and so we have, so as, as Darcy uh, and Laura talked about, you know, we're writing a plan. Uh, and uh, the, you know, the, the ECAC plays a role in that, the, the Energy and Climate Action Committee plays a role in that plan. But really, this is, we're writing that plan here with us. And as we start to get into what we were talking about solutions, it's like, well, we could do this and we could do this. What about this? Um, we need some ways to know, are we doing the right thing? Or are we not doing the right thing? And, uh, and so sort of trying to develop out of these conversations, and we've already brought a lot of things that, that really are key, are really important factors, really important things that are how we should be making decisions, uh, brought them up. And I wanna sort of get the, get the conversation focused on what are those important things? And so I'd like to just take a moment to recognize what Jennifer just said, which is that one of the important things that seems to be coming out of this conversation is that we need to do things together because we don't understand what, what each of us are going through. Um, Jennifer, you want to talk a little bit more about sort of Go Community? I'm multitasking, <laughs> so sorry about that. I'm calling you um, out. <laughs> um, but see, I'm on point because I'm here. Um, so, I, I like I don't really know how to to begin, and I mean that's part of the community participation officer is one of the th things that I am. I'm also the human rights coordinator, and one of the things that I've always been trying to work on is, or since I've been the the shift in the government is how do we connect to those folks who used to be me prior to me working here, right? And so it's hard and I try to do a lot of um, outreach when leisure services used to go to different places and have kids events and I would go and I just got off the phone with the library who's trying to maybe perhaps do something very similar to, you know, um, like a book mo mobile books book mobile right where they're going and they're they're reading and and stuff like that but you know it, it can just begin as simple stuff like that it can also begin if people are maybe so judgmental sometimes you know like there's a big difference between sympathy and empathy and i think that we all need to have a little more empathy we have no reason why we have no idea why people don't have cars or don't have this or don't have that and we just really need to be open-minded and like if you see somebody struggling like just try and help out 
right? Like I, I don't typically give the people that stand in the middle of the street money, but I had popsicles and I gave him a popsicle and he was so happy to have that popsicle because it was like 99 degrees outside and I was eating the popsicle too because I was hot and I just came out of the store. So, you know, he's hot from standing out there for hours and hours. So it's just tiny little things that we can do to help build our community and make it better and it goes the non-judgmental part goes on everybody's part right like it goes on the part person who might receive help it goes to the person who is going to help someone i mean it's just everybody we just all need to kind of and that's my yeah beautiful. what a beautiful thing to say jennifer um uh so two big principles right just just have become very important. One of those principles is empathy. And I would just, I'd like to note that, you know, probably Andy could use a little of our empathy uh, as, you know, we, we're trying to figure out, well, all these things don't work for us in the transportation system. I bet Andy's working darn hard to make it happen. Uh, and, uh, and conversely, you know, we all need empathy for uh, trying to get in, around on in in a different transportation modes and all the rassles that go with it and what happens if you're in a wheelchair and how difficult that I mean those are all things that need empathy um, and then the second is the idea of doing things together that's I think a really key part of a principle for how we build a climate action plan and a climate adaptation plan for the town. Um, are there other things that people have heard that start to, uh, start to rise to that level? I might add that there might be some principle around accessibility with a really wide view of what that means. I see Stephanie has a hand up. Oh, great. Sorry. Where are you, Stephanie? I'm not seeing. No, you. no worries, Jim. And I know you started to lead us to another direction, but I just wanted to actually comment um, on what Jennifer said. And then also actually to the previous conversation. I'm not sure you can see me because I had my hand up then, but. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, you no, were no. on the screen. Yeah. It's okay. Um, you know, it's interesting because I was very involved in the um, the implementation of the Valley Bike Stations, and I personally went before the um, uh, Disabilities and Access Advisory Committee, and th that is a group of people who are with wheelchairs or have mobility issues, and um, they reviewed the plans and I think it's one of those things where when you have plans and things are conceptual it's very different than when you actually implement them and I think there are times when things seemingly are like everything is the you know the appropriate width and the appropriate distance but when you actually install them um, either I mean things can get installed incorrectly and that is a reality that happens sometimes but i also think that the reality of then when people are actually trying to adhere to those you know whatever the required widths are it just doesn't always work um so i just think it's one of those things where you know um you know these kinds of conversations are really important because it's good to sort of go back and then sort of relook even if we've implemented things maybe things need to be changed or revised or looked at more carefully the next time so i just wanted to sort of throw that out there as part of this idea of communication and really sharing um, because you know it's a group of people who are in wheelchairs that helped sort of make those decisions actually in terms of the location of these things. But at the same time, um, if other people are having issues with them once they're installed, then that's something that we need to know. And if people don't communicate, then we have no way of knowing. All right, ooh, we got some action. Okay, uh, Gizikaya and then Eve. Um, I, I just wanted to respond to that 
um, thought about if people don't communicate, then we don't know. I think that, and we've talked about this a lot, but um, there are very concrete barriers in our uh, current government system within the town that um, prohibit people from communicating or like erase their communications. <laughs> um, I we've just come through several weeks of experiencing a lot of communication and that communication doesn't always uh, get acknowledged or received or acted upon. And so I want to be really careful about um, sort of putting the responsibility back on um, individuals to have to, um, you know, be responsible for things becoming more accessible based on how effectively they're able to communicate. And um, yeah, we've just, we've been able to identify that communication is really lacking in our town. Um, and I don't think it's lacking because there's not a way to do it. I think it, um, it has a lot to do with systemic racism and classism in our town. And I think that, you know, um, transportation does as well, um, as someone else alluded to earlier. And um, one of the things that um, I don't know how to frame it as a value, but um, thinking about uh, like the concept that comes to my mind is the, the thinking about the least of these or like who is the person that's being most negatively affected by a system and basing um, like targeting their needs because most likely when you target the needs of the person who has the most needs, everybody else's needs are going to be met. Um, it may be less convenient for those with privilege, but, um, but if we, like if there's a value that captures that idea, that would be something um, that's really important to me. And um, then also the, the value of um, acknowledging sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, in thinking about that, like, yes, some things are less environmentally friendly, but if somebody has, does not have access to an environmentally friendly um, option, are we, are we going to like lessen their ability to meet their basic needs by putting in something that's environmentally friendly? And like, is that actually, um, getting us towards a better world, which I hope is our ultimate goal. Great, thank you, Kazikaya. Um, I would uh, argue, just Seki, um, that there is a, a, a very strong principle in there. And that principle, uh, we've heard a little bit uh, sort of come up before, but it, that principle is uh, essentially building plans and actions based on the needs of those who will be most negatively affected by the plans and actions. And that means you have, we have to talk to them. We have, they have to be part of that process. Um, and I think there's a very strong principle there. Um, Eve, you want to uh, jump in? Yeah, um, I'm trying to figure out how to frame what I want to say um, because I don't, well, anyway, um, <laughs> but I, I think I want to start just by saying I really commend the ECAC for doing this process and some of the other inclusive processes that it has embarked upon. Um, as I said before, I've been involved in transportation committees in this town for about 11 years. I also was very involved in the controversy over the school consolidation proposal. Um, and in both of those experiences, I have tried, but not at all successfully, to push for more open and inclusive conversations. Um, and it's been very difficult to move things in that direction. I, you know, and I'm a volunteer very part-time and as many are and, um, but yeah, if I put, you know, with the, with the t more, I put more time than I had into both of those efforts um, over the years. And there are other people who have been, who've done that too. And it's still just, it's been very 
hard often to get sort of um, town apparatuses that are um, sort of used to doing the things the way they're doing, whether the cities or the administrations to um, to move towards more inclusion. I'm sorry, those alerts are gonna come in. There may be one more. Um, <clears throat> so I just really wanna commend the ECAC for starting in this way, because I've not been as you know part of a town process that sort of um, it really made this effort to be this inclusive right from the get-go before and you know it's not you know I'm sure there are people who aren't in the meeting today who should be but um, in fact I will actually mention a couple in a minute but um, but this is better than I've seen <laughs> and and that's really 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 welcome and and heartening and I just think it like I've already in this conversation there's so many things that all of you have brought up that just have so needed to be front and center in conversations about transportation in the last 11 years. It's just like, it's like, honestly, it's just such a relief to have them brought up in the first hour of a conversation. It's fabulous. Um, the, the, the people that I just want to mention <clears throat> that it would be good to bring in are actually the people who are officially part of town apparatuses that deal with transportation. Um, and in particular, there's the Transportation Advisory Committee, at which I used to be on, but I'm no longer on, that Tracy is on. So we do have a member from that committee now joining this conversation, which is great, but um, the chair is, is Aaron. <laughs> Why am I spacing Aaron's last name, guys? <laughs> Hayden. Oh, yeah, Hayden. Thank you. Aaron Hayden. Um, but then also the DPW, you know, the DPW um, gets a budget each year. They are trying to do way too many things. Um, they are answering to a bunch of people that we don't hear from, honestly, um, who are like the emergency responders who have to drive fire trucks um, to uh, the truckers, you know, who have very different kinds of needs from our transportation infrastructure. And my sense is that, you know, th that, that, that he gets earfuls from a lot of those people, that our DPW director gets earfuls from a lot of those people and that those drive a lot of his decision-making about sort of where dollars get spent and how wide roads need to be. We're always fighting about how wide roads need to be, frankly, that's like, you know, he wants every, travel lane to be at least 11 feet and I want every travel lane to be 9.5 feet, you know, uh, you know, because that would make a big difference in safety. Um, and, and it would give more room for bike lanes and buffers and anyway, so that is like little things like that that you would think would be um, really trivial, like turn out to be big issues if we want to change how transportation works and who and what it prioritizes is in this town. So anyway, at some point, we actually need to bring in the people that have to make, you know, those administrative decisions about, about budget, etc. Um, Amy is here from DPW. That's yeah. what people are trying to communicate to you. Oh, Amy, sorry. <laughs> so um, okay, that's what people are trying to communicate to me. Yeah. So I, so that's, anyway, so now I just feel stupid and I should let you talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, Amy, yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, just, no, and I don't have anything to add to the conversation. It's A-OK, -okay, Eve. I don't think I've had the chance to meet you, so I'll just introduce myself. Um, I'm Amy Rizeki. I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Public Works. Um, I go by she, her pronouns. And so I am here to represent Public Works. And so, I, you know, I do appreciate this conversation and, you know, certainly listening to a lot of it and it's you know it's the same stuff that we kick around as we're trying to prioritize projects and so certainly a lot of this conversation is is heard and is had both inside our office as well as outside so um thanks great thank you amy uh, and thank you for joining us um uh the sort of previous thing you were talking about eve uh two things about the process one is i just would like to recognize Laura and Darcy and Stephanie for really moving this forward. Uh, really just a, you know, really great job. 
Uh, and obviously, Gizikaya has played a huge role. But I would also like to say that we're just getting started and we need to make this process better. And if you have thoughts about how to make it better or want to help make it better, we would love to hear and to work with you. Um, and, uh, you know, that this, this is, we have to get better and better. Kind of like what Stephanie was talking about in, you know, making the decisions about where infrastructure goes or where the bike share goes and that you, you know, tried to make the right decisions, but then when it actually happens, it's like it has, it turns out it's not right. And there, there's a, a principle there. And the principle is in the, in the natural, in the sort of ecological world, there's a principle called adaptive management. And it's a kind of a lousy word. It's a little technocratic. But what that word says is you do things and then you look and then you ask, is it working? Then you change it. And that that's how you get better and better. Um, and that a model of, there's a principle here of, can we do things that we know may not be the right thing to do? We think they are, but we probably want to look, we probably want to ask, and we probably want to then do it again. And that's not a bad thing. That's not failure. It's moving to success. Um, I see Brenda has a hand. Great, Brenda. Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, I just have a procedural question, um, just in terms of um, how we'll proceed through our three sessions and what we're hoping for the outcome. Um, because I just realized I'm like, oh, this was just the introductions. <laughs> we're almost through this session. So I'm, I'm wondering, um, you had said like format, will there be like breakout groups and um, specific questions? Um, so yeah, just to, if, I would just appreciate that uh, just, to, just to hear the, the, the quick overview. Thank you. Great. Yeah, that's a great question. We kind of didn't really dive too far into that when we first started. Um, so the concept is we have three meetings with this group. Um, we can do more in between. If there are things you want to dive into, we can do some work in between. Everybody is available. We can also do some stuff afterwards. But the concept is that there are three meetings. The first meeting is really about developing principles and about how is it we're gonna make decisions. Second meeting is really about starting to look at solutions. What kinds of strategies might work to do some of the things we're interested in? And we have a couple of other topics other than transportation that are probably worth diving into. The third meeting, the concept is that the third meeting is about how do we prioritize or, or how do we actually achieve those things that we're talking about? We may or may not get there. We may spend the next two meetings really talking about what the next, what the actions are that we think are valuable and do they fit in our set of principles and in our set of values. Um, and we need to be sort of flexible in that because we have a kind of a big topic. Um, but that's, that's really sort of where we're at. Kazikaya, you uh, want to add to that? Yeah, I was just going to mention that these were not introductions only. It was really an activity to gather information on, you know, one of our topics, which is transportation, um, and to really be able to hear about what's coming up for people, what are relevant experiences that people are actually having, having in the community, and then to be able to use those real life experiences to, like Jim said, come up with what are our actual values that we're going to be trying to center as we do the work about thinking about what we need to prioritize. So it, it was definitely part introductions, but more seeking to have um, a conversation about per personal experiences that would allow us to really be able to identify values, not in a vacuum, but in response to the actual lived experiences. It, it, it's worked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Tracy. 
Um, so I guess one of my questions is that you mentioned that we cover other topics as well, including, you know, transportation, but also other infrastructure, including like water, wastewater and things. I mean, so there is also a land use task group, right? And it seems like some of those things, and I, I guess part of me is like wearing like a planner hat because that's like some of my training is just that, I mean, a lot of those things really do tie into land uses and that, and so we didn't talk, I mean, in our discussion so far, right, we focus on transportation. So I, I guess I have questions about how much we need to include some of those other topics. Now, I also noticed that we do have public health and um, some of the work that I've been doing for my job recently is around um, just how transportation systems with transit and otherwise like do tie into public health and um, equity and um, I've been looking at models from around the country, including, and I guess, and I guess we're not supposed to talk about solutions, but like Seattle has some really great policies. For example, I know Eve mentioned Portland, but Seattle has like a countywide um, social justice and equity like ordinance and like all of their efforts, not just in transportation, but for all of their policies in the county and all their plans and so on are supposed to go through that lens. Um, so there's some really great work being done and it does tie into the health piece. So. Thanks. I think that's a great, great comment, uh, Tracy, about sort of the, the interconnection of transportation and public health. And that was mm. part of why they, that was part of this group. Uh, and, um, and I think we can be thinking about public health while we think about transportation, while we think about waste in ways that tie these things together. Uh, I think it's a real opportunity. Um, uh, I'm going to go to Rob, who has very patiently had his hand up for a little while. Uh, so, Rob. Yeah, so I, I want to try to draw together a couple of things that I heard. Uh, I forget who said which, but you would know if you said them. So one is the idea that for transportation, especially public transportation, we should try to be addressing the greatest sort of in need of an individual. The individual has the, the, the most at risk for not having access. And I just want to point out there's an interesting tension there between the other goal of public transportation is trying to provide some basic level of service for the greatest number. And, and th there's a tension between those. Um, the PBTA is, of course, made it uh, a practice to provide low fare van service to people who wouldn't normally be able to use a bus within a certain distance of the fixed routes. And so that, that's one way that you balance the use of very large vehicles on a fixed schedule to smaller vehicles that can get to places that the buses don't go. But there's a tension there that I think points then to a bigger issue, which is a major social issue that's come up uh, in all other categories, like healthcare and education, is whether transit is a fundamental human right that deserves to be provided through sort of the general, as you know, matter of the general welfare through general taxation rather than fares. And I've long been an advocate to increase the use of transit, make it accessible to everybody, to have no fares at all, fare free transit. And so, interesting, some of the people who actually run transit systems love that idea. And it's been done in a few parts of the country. The Amherst area is one of the few places that has a essentially fare free transit system. Uh, I think Boulder, Colorado, I'm actually not remembering now, maybe one of the other communities that has it. But, but again, they, they tend to be near higher education institutions. So what we're really doing is we're taxing students largely pay here through fees that, but, but the idea just abroad that we have essentially zero fares and raise raise the revenue to operate transit through the general taxation is one that I, I hope we'll be thinking about um, not so much as a solution just a, it's a, it's one of the tensions because when we, when we don't have enough money to run a transit system then we lose the service and um, it's often been argued that fares sort of help you fund it well not really <laughs> they actually pay a tiny fraction of it they do give a way of sort of counting, but there are other ways of counting. I speak as a mathematician on that one. Um, so I, I, hope, I hope we'll think about that because the, 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 this fundamental concept that transit or getting from, from one place to another, either 
we're doing it virtually now, but is, is a fundamental right, fundamental human right, I hope is something we, we could explore because I think it's important. And I, I support it as a fundamental right. I hope others will weigh in. Thanks, Rob. And it, it, in thinking about that idea of transit as a fundamental right, it then recognizes the needs, it, it forces the recognition of, of, of a wide set of needs and, and, uh, and voices uh, because as a right, then it, we have to, it, those rights have to go to everybody. Um, it's a really, really interesting way of phrasing that. Other people want to talk a little bit about uh, sort of uh, key principles uh, that you think are important in this conversation around transportation or maybe public health or maybe waste. Kazika? Uh, one of the principles that I was going to um, bring up when Tracy was talking was around the intersections between all the different um, human needs. And um, we thought a lot about how to split up these groups and there were a hundred different versions because it's true, all, they're, they all intersect. And um, I was thinking about how transportation really connects with housing, um, which is not something that our group is specifically talking about, but I know Penny has a lot of thoughts about housing and housing access in Amherst. And I know that I have always chosen where to live or have moved based on um, transportation. So I was wondering, Penny, if you um, had anything you wanted to say about that. Yeah, I just think that with this, like when I, like I said, I moved here in the 70s. And um, so I pretty much have lived in, I lived in Colonial Village. I lived in, um, Rolling Green, and, and I lived in Puffton when I was a kid, but I'm just saying as an adult with my own kids, living in Rolling, uh, Rolling Green and Colonial Village, Rolling, it was very expensive, and I wouldn't have been able to do it if I didn't have housing. And it's like, I feel like everyone should be able to live where they want to live. And it should, shouldn't be this thing where you have to have a subsidy to be able to live in a house that you don't have to have someone next to you. And that you don't have to like live in an apartment complex because that's the only where you can afford. I just feel like that is crazy. And I know people who are homeless now who don't have a place and they're living out of their car. And if you have to do first loss and security, and the only reason why you're doing the security is because there's so many students who ruin the property that it just makes it harder for the people who live here in Amherst. Or you, and then you have to outsource in Sunderland and or Belchertown, and then it's harder to get transportation to go to the grocery store. It's just a big, vicious circle that's not fair at all. Not fair. So. Um, I'm going <laughs> to love. Thank you, Penny. And I'll stick to it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Penny. That awesome. was well put. Right on. Um, Lev, you've had your hand up for a little while. Great. Um, Thanks. Um, I just wanted, in terms of values and approaches, um, I think one of, uh, particularly in when we're talking about public transit, I think it's very easy to think really purely in terms of economies of scale. Um, and I think that there's also actually a lot of advantages with um, tackling these various challenges that we're looking at with um, really just recognizing that there isn't going to be one silver bullet solution for all of the different challenges and that actually I think the way um, and I think this is 
maybe a little bit of a blending of or recognition of the tension that what Rob has mentioned and that Gazit um, Kaya brought up earlier is thinking about that not every single solution has to work for every single person, but we need to make sure that we're really, I guess from my perspective, is like that we have to be centering and most focused actually on the needs of uh, where they are the highest or sort of the most vulnerable person so that it's not that we come up with a good solution that works for, the whole, for a whole bunch of people and then it leaves a bunch of other folks out. But I think just really recognizing that there can be a lot of, uh, there can be good solutions that are a myriad of different approaches. Um, and in a lot of ways, I think that um, in response to COVID-19, um, in part because organizations had to respond so quickly and it was as brand new that we actually, we saw a lot of that um, real kind of innovation happening in lots of different places where it was like throwing out lots of things and kind of seeing what works. And that's a common process in design ideation. And I think it doesn't only have to be about the ideation of then deciding which one thing to go to. It can be that you move forward um, and really solidify or formalize um, multiple, uh, multiple different tracks. Great, thank you. Uh, Jennifer, you uh, were ready to jump. Oh, yes, because I love talking about housing. Like, it's just um, a mind baffle. Like, well, it, it's only just a mind baffle, but it also shows you that the whole infrastructure from DTA to, to the housing, um, to the Section 8 program, how none of that really is made to help the individual. It's so I just remember at some point it was like, oh, you can go to two-year college, but we won't support you to go to UMass. And it's like, what? What? I can go to hair and nail school, but I can't become a doc. Like, I don't understand. But um, I think with housing, we have like, there's two different kinds of affordable housing that are lacking. Like there's an affordable housing that's lacking for the people who do have subsidies. That limit is so low compared to what the apartments and houses are rented for that they're literally pushed out. And then you have the people who, like myself, are, you know, we work and so we can pay more and we don't need the, the subsidy, but I can't pay 3500 for a three bedroom apart house. I like, um, and part of that house issue was I was in a house last year where the rent was for four bedrooms was decent, but the utilities, that electric bill in the winter was from 800 to $1,000 a month. And we were only heating three to four rooms at a time because nothing's insulated. And the, they had old wooden windows, right? And, you know, they would get stuck. You can't even open them in the summer. They would swell. And so there's just all of these kinds of things that need to work out, which I, that was part of like ECAC for, you know, um, we're doing houses and apartments is part of it and I also just and I know we're not talking about solutions but I have like this notion in my mind like I just don't understand why we can't find 10 landlords who own multiple properties and ask them to designate one to one affordable and the other one to the other affordable and compensate them somehow I don't know how we would compensate them like I don't know if we could do it through taxes through sewer water through whatever but like I just it just seems again it's community like look out for your brother and your sister and it it'll 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 adjust itself and work out so um I'm big on affordable housing issues and and stuff as such fabulous thank you Jennifer that it, uh, it's a uh, Th these issues are super tight together. Um, it's not really quite in the wheelhouse of this committee, but it is definitely part of the part of what's happening. It's great because all the kids go to school together. That's the crazy part about it is all of our kids are in school together, but they all have different different lives. Everyone's everyone's on crazy spectrum, but the kids are all <laughs> friends. And so when my kids would go to this house and they would come home and say, hey, and I'd be like, sorry, hopefully you get to go back over their house again. So, yeah. I totally get it. Uh, thanks, Penny. I'm Laura. Yeah. Good. Thanks, Jim. Um, thanks all, I've been really enjoying listening to this conversation. 
I just want to reiterate what Gazi Kaya mentioned, which is that we will be um, taking notes and making sure when we come back together, so each of the task groups has two ECAC members on it. When we come back together in our ECAC groups, we're going to be in our ECAC committee, which anyone's welcome to join as public members of, um, we'll be talking uh, about things that we've seen crossover between the different groups and how we make sure the groups for which may need to be identifying actions related to those topics are doing so. We have talked quite a bit in ECAC about the need for affordable, oh, I have a guest, sorry. <laughs> um, the need for affordable housing to not only be about rent, but about utilities, because that's so important and sometimes over overlooked in those discussions, in my, at least that, that I've seen. Awesome, thank you, uh, thank you, Laura. Um, that actually sort of brings us up. We, uh, we're kind of getting up to the end of our time. Uh, and we really appreciate everybody spending the time and, and ex you know, bringing yourself forward, sharing your experience, sharing your, your thoughts about what's important. Uh, would anybody, anybody have a sort of, uh, want something they want to sort of final, the final word, as it were, anybody have something you want to say you really need to get out? Yeah, Brenda? Um, I, d I just wanted to point out the time because I do need to hop off right before, but uh, do we have any homework? Anything that we should yes, be thinking you do. about? Oh. <laughs> I'm one of those people, sorry. Uh, you know, there's always <laughs> one in the crowd. Uh, um, Laura, Darcy, you want to uh, lead us through that? Your... Uh, I'm, I'm inviting Laura to do that because I don't have my agenda right in front of me. Okay. And if need be, I have, I have it in front of me. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's sort of similar to what using an opportunity to introduce ourselves, but also to collect information. I think um, it'd be great for folks to think about um, both for themselves and then maybe ask three neighbors or maybe friends that don't live in your direct vicinity would even be more uh, helpful. Um, what are the issues, uh, sorry, I'm gonna read these off. What, and this is around waste. So transitioning a little bit um, to one of our other topic areas. What are the issues with garbage for you? Where does your trash go? Do you know where your trash goes? Do you have access to recycling or compost? Who controls those decisions? Are they decisions you're making or is someone else controlling those decisions for you? Um, and what barriers do you personally have or do the friends or neighbors that you're speaking to have um, to disposing of your waste in a way that feels um, sort of good for you, <laughs> if that's a way to frame it. Um, and you could really reframe those questions and we'll email, I believe we're emailing these out. So no need to, to jot all these down. But you could also think about those in the terms of the other, other two topics, public health and, um, and communication. So, so yeah, and, and feel free if you would rather write them down, you can respond to the email with your responses um, or we can bring them to, to the next meeting. Is that correct, Jim? Uh, actually, uh, yeah. collect the information, go ahead and ask people, send it to Gazikaya, uh, and we're going to collect all that stuff up and put it into a form, and then we'll have an opportunity to share it as the beginning of the, the next meeting uh, to sort of transition into the next set of topics. Perfect. And, and no you, pressure to, to talk to friends or neighbors. If you just want to share your own experiences, right. that's fine too. But you if, may you find feel, it if you feel the energy please, it would be wonderful. And I was just going to say, you will get an email from me with the questions and you can also um, talk to me on the phone if that works better for you to talk about your answers. Um, so you'll be getting that um, from me before the end of the week. And people are welcome to reach out to Gazikaya, myself or Laura or Darcy, um, if you just want to connect with us about anything um, before the next meeting. In fact, I'd make that a little bit stronger and say, if there are topics that you feel strongly about, you really want to make sure you are thinking and deep in, uh, you want to know more about, you want to tell more about, uh, 
connect with Gazikaya, connect with Stephanie, connect with Lara, connect with Darcy. Uh, and it, you can do that by phone, by email. Uh, this is a great opportunity to dive in deeper if there are things you really feel strongly about and want to sort of bring to the, bring up to the top. Stephanie has all of our information, so you can get contact information from Stephanie. Bruce Penny, Stephanie. was there something you wanted to say? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. It was, thank you, it was a good meeting. I'd just like to thank everybody again for coming and, and, and participating and, you know, sharing yourselves and your experiences. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we are taking notes. The notes, uh, we'll compile the notes into uh, something readable uh, and share them with everyone. Feel free to correct them, to add to them. Uh, that's a way to sort of provide more information back. Uh, and then we'll probably clean those up and condense them a little bit and then those will get shared back to the ECAC as well to sort of pass on some of the knowledge that we're getting from this process. So it's exactly four o'clock. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate everybody uh, being here. Thank you all. Thank you everybody. Thank you.